One of the things I always am interested in is a Bible student having balanced knowledge. Praise the Lord, everyone. We're back, and let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we're so thankful for you revealing to our hearts the root cause of some of our problems, the root cause of sickness, the root cause of disease, the root cause of ignorance. Oh, God, it is sin. But you've given us a remedy for sin. As blood wars and blood bought believers, you said if we confess our sins, that you are faithful and just to forgive us of every sin, that you will cleanse us from all that is unrighteous. And therefore you allow us entrance directly into your presence so that we may obtain mercy and the very grace of God to help in the time of need. In Jesus' name, amen. We're continuing our topic on sin, the origin of it, what caused it, and much more importantly, how to get above it. And so we left off talking about the fact that the adversary is not all powerful. The adversary is not everywhere at the same time. The adversary doesn't know everything. The adversary is one that always changes. He's a chameleon. Not like God who's immutable. Not like God who's omniscient. Not like God who's omnipresent. Not like God who's omnipotent. So that tells you something. The implication there is, can Satan make you sin? And what's needed for you to sin? What's needed for you to sin is your cooperation. Remember we said earlier that he can't make you do anything any more than he made Eve and Adam sin. He must have an audience. He must have your willingness. And James speaks to that. In James chapter 1, in verse number 13, the word of God says, Let no man say when he is tempted, see, God doesn't tempt. I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempted, tempteth he any man. Well, what happens? But every man is tempted when he is drawn away by his own lusts and enticed. And notice the imagery of the birthing process here. Then when lust hath conceived, hmm, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. See, saints of God, the adversary is the ultimate deceiver. He roars, seeking whom he may devour. Think about it. If the adversary was so powerful, why didn't he destroy you before you got saved? Think about it. You didn't know anything about God. And the little bit you knew about God, you were doing what you wanted to do when you wanted to do it. You were totally outside of the ark of safety. One of the best examples was to destroy you. And how about this? Since you've been saved, why hasn't he destroyed you now? Because he is under the domination and the power of God. He couldn't make you sin before you were saved. You had to cooperate. Certainly you didn't have the power to live above sin. But the adversary would have loved to destroy you. But how many know God had his hand on you? Oh my God. The hand of God is all over you. You see, Satan functions within the sovereign purposes of God. To do what? to achieve the things that God has decreed and ordered for the salvation of sinners. What does that mean? That means some people who may have been uh, painfully uh, violated in their lives, and it certainly was an act of the adversary and all of his minions. But because of the awesome power of God, God will use that violation Use that person who was violated and as a testimony to the glory of God will see the salvation of many others who have been violated. The act was not of God, 
the sinful act that was all perpetrated by the devil was not of God. But because the person who the act was perpetrated against was God's vessel, God then uses his vessel to bring about the ultimate good in that person's life. Hallelujah. Why? Because they are chosen by God and they're called according to God's purpose. Satan functions within the sovereign purposes of God to ensure the damnation of sinners and to triumph over destruction and evil. The people who have done the things that they have done will have to give an account. Everybody will come under the judgment of God. There'll be a white throne judgment for the people who are going to hell. There'll be the judgment seat of Christ for the people going to heaven. But everybody will be judged. And there's a context here of the implication for this today. You see, the issue with sin, ladies and gentlemen, hear me now, is independence from God. Remember I told you from the very beginning that disobedience is sin. And oftentimes people think that it is to their benefit to be independent of God so that they can be quote-unquote free. But is freedom independence? Think about it. You know this naturally and spiritually. You can have freedom and be heavily dependent upon someone else. Let me give you an example. We live in a quote-unquote free country, but we're dependent upon the democratic government to rule. You, spiritually, have freedom in Christ, but yet you rejoice in your dependence upon him. You see, God offered Adam and Eve the privilege of freedom and the joy of dependence. What do you mean by that? Let's talk about that for a moment. You know, I found this to be the case with my children and even when I was a child. When I was dependent upon the rule and the reign of my mother and my father, I had the joy and the privilege of that freedom. I got more and more of the things that I always wanted because I was obedient to their authority. You see, when people reject dependent upon God, they choose a far more costly dependence. They depend on the world. They depend on their own resources. They depend on their own abilities. And how many know you forfeit the favor and the sovereign power of God for your life? I love a quote made by a great author by the name of John H. Walton. He said, freedom from God forges new chains. Oh, what a powerful revelation. That is a powerful word. And so uh, let's talk just for a bit. And that is on this 15th chapter, uh, pardon me, on Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. I want to go there for a moment because it shows you that even from the beginning of time, even when sin, it's talking about the sovereignty of God, even when sin seemed to raise up its ugly head to destroy mankind, God had a provision. God had a way in which he was going to bring his people into deliverance. Hallelujah. In Genesis chapter 3 and verse number 15, the word of God says, And I will put enmity, hostility, between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. He shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. It really speaks to the ultimate salvation that we have through Jesus Christ that his heel would be bruised. It speaks to his suffering on the cross, his ultimate death, and, of course, soon resurrection. But it also speaks to his ability to destroy the head of the en enemy. But let's talk in application of what it means for the heel to be uh, stricken, if you will, the heels of the serpent striking the heels, even in the context of us living right now. See, there's a continual, ongoing, unresolved conflict between human beings and evil because of sin. Let me give you some examples. The Bible says that as a result of this sinful act of Adam and Eve, that the man would dominate the woman. Think about it. It's a basic instinct for a woman to have children. But guess what? 
They can't have one without a man. And therefore, the Bible says that the woman will always desire a man. Hmm. Uh, you say, well, I can have a child without a man. No, but you can't have it without some uh, sperm. So you got to get it from somewhere. And wherever you get it from, it had to come from a man. On the other hand, the Bible says because of sin that the ground would no longer bring forth favor. You find that in Genesis chapter 3, verse 17 through 19. The ground would yield God's favor and protection, but now, even though we could cultivate the ground, even today, it's harder. It's harder. Why? Because the ground yields forth fruit and weeds. What are the other manifestations? The issues in the Middle East right now is simply a manifestation of what happened from the beginning of time. Because of sin, ongoing wars, culture, and ladies and gentlemen, and tactics may change, but wars never change because what's rooted in wars is sin. There are spiritual battles that speak to the striking of the heels that, that's right there sourced in Genesis chapter 3, verse 17. There's the, the infiltration of the world system into our way of thinking. And some of these manifestations are evident, the same sex agenda. Lives being threatened because of a Christian worldview. There are many people that are being destroyed simply because they believe in Jesus Christ. There are places in this world in which people are being killed, maimed, because of their view of Jesus Christ. Think about just some of the things that you even see in modern day of what is what I call non-political correctness. Now, uh, the lack of sensitivity toward people is viewed to be positive. It speaks to the moral decline that's in the world in which we live. Think about elections that are won, candidates who win elections by spewing evil and character assassination of other people, and there's an audience for it. Why is there an audience for it? Why is there an audience for someone to see another person from another country chop someone's head off? Why is that? It's because of sin. In fact, the word sin has dropped out of our vocabulary. Think about it. When you hear about the word sin, it's ascribed to things that are supposedly good, sinfully delicious. Oh my God, what kind of world have we degenerated to? See, the meaning of the word has declined, sin, but not its impact. You see it every day. This is the subtlety. This is the craftiness of the adversary. And this is why society finds it difficult to understand the absolute importance of salvation. Think about it. It's hard to feel a need for salvation when you don't feel or you don't know you've done anything wrong. And see, that's where we are as a society, saints of God. People are doing whatever are the dictates of their hearts. And the freedom of autonomy from God has created the consequences of the sin that we're experiencing right now. But in spite of all this sin, God is still in control. Hallelujah. God's control, ladies and gentlemen, is not diminished by the choice of Adam and Eve, and even your choice. You see, we can't remove ourselves from the control of God. Without God, we don't exist at all. The Bible says in Proverbs 19 and 21, there are many devices in a man's heart. Nevertheless, the counsel of the Lord, that shall stand. You can't get outside of the sovereignty and the power of God. I don't care how much sin occurs. Isaiah 46 and 10 says, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand, hallelujah, and I will do all my pleasure. I'm reminded about the psalmist in Psalm 139 where it says, Thou compass me, uh, compass my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. God knows everything about you. I don't care what the sin may be or what the sin may not be. 
Verse number four says, For there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, thou knowest all together. Thou hast beset me behind and before, and laid thy hands upon me. My God. Saints, God does not manipulate. He doesn't need to be protected. God is not selfishly driven. God's plans are not in jeopardy because of the sin in this world. I'll leave you with one last scripture before we move to our next segment. Isaiah says in 46 and 11, Calling the ravenous bird from the east, the man that executeth my counsel from a far country, yea, I have spoken it, I will also bring it to pass. I have purposed it, I will also do it. Look forward to you coming back in Jesus' name.